Hi everyone, my name is Shantanu Kishwar and I am a research associate with the Vision India Foundation. Today I am going to be giving a book review and summary of Sanjeev Sanya's third book, The Ocean of Churn, How the Indian Ocean Shaped Human History. For the sake of this, to keep it short, I am going to have to skip over a lot of the details, so I really suggest that you, you know, get a copy of the book and read it yourself. It's uh, quite worth it. So the introduction to the book uh, starts with a story from the Pallava kingdom that used to rule over a large part of South India. So the story goes that at a time when they were facing a crisis of succession, the Pallava sent a delegation of Brahmins to a faraway land across the seas where generations earlier a Pallava prince had gone and established his own rule. So the youngest son of the, the king of um, this faraway land was brought back uh, to ascend the throne and he was crowned Nandi Varman Pallava Malla. Now, the book claims that this king, Nandi Varman, had come from the Khmer Kingdom of Cambodia, uh, which is based on a variety of evidence uh, presented that links the culture, art, um, and uh, society of uh, both the Pallavas and the Khmer Kingdom. And the reason Sanya uses this story to begin the book is to illustrate the way in which there have been co connections in the uh, polity, the art, society, economy, and the culture of um, areas across the Indian Ocean, which have had a very real impact even today. So much before the arrival of Vasco da Gama and other Europeans, uh, the Indian Ocean had seen a lot of interactions taking place on both sides and um, it's this that gave the Indian Ocean a crucial position in global affairs right up till about the 19th century when the Atlantic Ocean became a little more important. So what Sanya is trying to do here is to give a popular history of these interactions that have happened across the Indian Ocean, though there's an implicit focus on India in the middle of it all. Um, what he's looking at is the larger Indian Ocean universe in terms of the Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea, Straits of Malacca, Persian Gulf, and not just the narrowly defined Indian Ocean of today. He's trying to shed the Eurocentric bias of history writing and also show that in Indian history, when you look at things from the coastal lands instead of from the central empires, things look very different. You have a lot of new characters coming in, a whole bunch of new perspectives, and a lot of preconceived notions are challenged when you look at it this way. So, the second chapter of the book looks at the geographical evolution of the Indian Ocean region and the genetic evolution of the people that inhabit this region. Um, the ocean was formed primarily due to changing plate tectonics. So, around 175 years, uh, million years ago, the supercontinent of Pangaea broke up into Gondwana land and into Eurasia. Now, India was originally a part of Gondwana land, but it began moving towards Eurasia and about 55 million years ago uh, clashed with the Eurasian plate also giving rise to the Himalayas in the process. Now, the water body surrounding the subcontinent then became the Indian Ocean. Um, after that, you've had a considerable number of factors that have also affected uh, the evolution of the ocean. Uh, coastlines and changing sea levels have um, been affected by natural phenomena such as the ice ages or changing weather patterns, and also more recently by human intervention. Uh, by around 7,000 years ago, they had stabilized and between 0 and 1800 AD, they were uh, about the same, but these coastlines and sea levels have begun changing again. So, how did humans settle in the region? You have the rise of modern Homo sapiens about 200,000 years ago in the Rift Valley in Africa. Now, about 60,000 years ago, one uh, band of these people moved uh, across out of Africa into Yemen, which would have been quite easy because this was a time of an ice age when the sea levels were relatively lower. Um, they further moved then into the Makran coast around the Persian Gulf and uh, settled there. So around 50,000 years ago, one of the groups from here moved uh, into Southeast Asia and in about another 5 to 10,000 years, they moved all the way to Australia. And this, despite the lowered sea levels, would have required some sort of primitive maritime uh, technology or boats. So around 40,000 years ago, you had another migration taking place. Um, one group of people moved again into Southeast Asia, which was one undivided landmass because uh, sea levels were a lot lower due to the ice ages. Um, other groups also moved across the Eurasian landmass into Siberia and parts of Europe. Around 35,000 years ago, you have the first settlements in the Indian subcontinent and you have uh, one group of people moving to South India. So these people were called the ancestral South Indians. Around 25,000 years ago, you have one uh, male lineage, which is called R1, that settled in the Persian Gulf again. Now this broke off into two separate migration groups, one which went into Europe and one which moved into North India. 
um the group that moved into north india is called uh, the ancestral north indians um now looking at the ancestral north indians and the ancestral south indians you shouldn't confuse them with the aryans and dravidians that's a uh, much more complicated debate and sanya actually goes into some depths looking at what this means for the aryan debate itself organized settlements have existed in the region and were usually centered around organized food production farming arose independently across the area but was centered around rivers though there was an intense pressure on these resources because of low sea levels and because of um, drier climates so the end of the ice age was marked by warmer climates and rising sea levels uh, culminating in a great flood um so interestingly most ancient civilizations have myths surrounding a great flood and perhaps this is the flood that they refer to uh, the rising sea levels obviously meant that certain land masses got separated so sri lanka was separated from india and uh, southeast asia became a group of islands separated by seas large population migrations obviously occurred because of this so in southeast asia you had population moving northwards towards china and um, in the indo iranian region you have people carrying the r1a1a gene moving to central asia and then into europe which explains part of the linguistic similarities between um, central asian languages and uh, european languages